Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. The Penang South Reclamation Project, which is now also known as the Penang South Islands, has re-emerged re as a hot button issue in recent weeks. So tonight on the show, we'll be looking at the trade-offs involved in the land reclamation of three islands, which is the crux of Penang's 46 billion ringgit transport master plan, as it is these islands that will be financing, uh, will be used to finance uh, the public transport projects. So both the transport master plan and the reclamation project have drawn criticism from civil society groups, environmental activists, fishermen, and politicians from both sides of the political divide. But despite numerous objections, the Penang state government says it will proceed. So let's speak to a representative of the Penang state government tonight. Let's hear from Zairel Kir Johari. He's the Penang state exco for uh, in infrastructure and transport. Good evening, Zairel. Thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. Um, Hi, let's speak in. Hi. Yes, let's begin our conversation. I think I'd, I'd like you to help us um, understand how these projects actually fit into the Penang State Government's development goals. I think what I'm curious about here is what is the priority for the Penang State Government? Sure. Now, you see, before uh, uh, I say anything, I'd like to say that this project, the PSR, is a project for the future of Penang. Now, before Penang began industrializing in the 70s, the poverty rate in Penang was 44%. That's nearly half the people in Penang living in poverty uh, because there were no jobs. Young Penang people were leaving for jobs in KL, Singapore, everywhere else. Uh, and, uh, but thankfully, we industrialized in the 70s, and the rest, as you know, is history. Today, the poverty rate in Penang is 2%, much lower than the 5.6% national average. And half of the jobs today are in manufacturing. So you can say that industrialization saved Penang. But building the industrial zones, did it displace people? Did it displace villages? Yes. Did it damage the environment? Yes. It did damage the environment. And did we lose agricultural land? We did. These are the costs of development. But what are the benefits? The benefit is jobs. The benefit is today we have economic security. We all enjoy middle-class lives in Penang because of uh, the industrial zones that we built. And uh, last year, in 2020, a year where, you know, the whole world was ravaged by COVID, Penang recorded the highest trade surplus in the country. So while everyone else was going down, we were still, you know, holding strong, thanks to our industrial sector. But here's the, you know, sort of a danger uh, situation. Uh, recently, MIDA released the investment figures for this year. And Penang was out of the top five for the first time. Out of the top five. And our neighboring state got 42 billion ringgit in investment. Now, uh, I have to say, I can say firsthand that we actually lost out on a major chunk of this 42 billion ringgit because we were out of land. We had no land to offer to the investors. That's why it's so, can, can, yeah, can, can we can we address the land issue? Because I think uh, some of the uh, criticism has been that there's actually plenty of land on the mainland, and that by opting for the reclamation projects off the island, uh, it some in many ways uh, it accentuates uh, sorry accentuates the uneven development in the state has between the island and the mainland. Isn't there a lot of land? In on the mainland to be used? That's a great question, uh, Sharad. Uh, look, this is the uh, situation. There are 10 industrial parks in Penang. Only one is on the island. Nine out of 10 industrial parks are on the mainland. We have industrial parks in all three districts in the mainland, and they are oversaturated. They are full. The, old, the latest and most recent industrial park that we built, the Batukawan Industrial Park, uh, has only plots that are less than 10 acres in size. Now, when some of these major investors came, you know, when we talk about 10 billion, 20 billion uh, ringgit investments, they need 20, 30, 40, even some up to 50 acres. We don't have land to offer them. 
And recently, if you read the H newspaper, the Penang State Government is being sued by the landowner of land that we are trying to acquire in Subang Prai in order to turn into industrial land. The fact of the matter is, the state of Penang does not own any more land in Subang Prai. And when we try to acquire private land, we get into legal entanglement. And whatever we have left is not enough. So we have to think about the future. And unless, you know, we are okay with cutting the land, cutting the hills on the island, we have no choice but to look for suitable reclamation sites. Zyril, these three islands that will be, uh, that, you know, the land reclamation islands, are they all going to be used for industrial sites? Are these, is this going to be used for uh, industrial zones? Yeah, uh, good question, Melissa. There are three islands. Uh, the largest island, which is 2,300 acres, that will be the island that will host the new industrial park. It will be the first island that will be developed. Uh, and, uh, and that's the whole idea. Uh, our strategy is to create jobs, first and foremost. You asked earlier what our priority was. It's jobs. So we want to create a new, expand our industrial park, uh, 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 create more, uh, bring in investments, create more jobs. And when you have jobs, you will naturally need the commercial and residential uh, components that come after it. But without creating the jobs, it's going to be another forest city, which we are trying to avoid. We don't want another forest city in Penang. Zario, in terms of the, uh, the concerns uh, about uh, the environment, about fisher folk, what, what is your base, your bottom line with that? Is it just that this is an un, um, unavoidable trade-off that needs to happen in order to achieve the priorities that you just laid out? Okay, uh, so I'll address both. Firstly, in terms of the environment, yes, there will be some environmental impact. Uh, you know, building a house also leaves a permanent uh, environmental impact, but that doesn't mean we don't build houses. But let's not kid ourselves, okay? This area which we have uh, 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 identified as the reclamation area is not the Great Barrier Reef. There is no unique biodiversity. It's not a rich breeding ground for fishes. Uh, it is basically shallow, muddy water, which that's why it's the most suitable site for reclamation. So that said, there's not going to be no impact. Of course, there will be impact. But that's why we're going to comply with all the conditions set by the environmental uh, uh, department. All 72 conditions, we will uh, comply. And on top of that, uh, we have also come up with, a, I have to say, a, a really comprehensive assistance package for the fishermen who will be impacted. Uh, we're going to give them options. They can be employed during the duration of the uh, reclamation, which will take more than a decade. Or uh, we're, we're also offering to uh, uh, upgrade their tools, give them new boats, give them new uh, uh, engines, give, build new jetties for them, uh, and, and so on. We're committed to assisting uh, the communities that are affected. That goes without saying. Cyril, can I ask you, do you, does the state government believe that um, this project will be popular with voters? Uh, I think the answer to that, uh, Melissa, is that we campaigned in the last election on the premise of building this project. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the voters uh, spoke through the ballot box. Uh, and I think when we speak to ordinary Penangites who are worried about their economic well-being, about the future, about the jobs that they want for their kids, uh, they do want development and they do want uh, economic growth and they do want this project. So why do the Zyril, critics do you continue the then, Zyril? Sorry, just a, a quick follow-up, Sharad. I'm just wondering, Zyril, then mm -hmm. why, do, why do the critics continue? Because I'm just wondering, um, what, which part are the pain points? Is it the reclamation of these three islands? Is it the financing of the uh, transport master plan? Or is it the, the public transport projects that will come after? Which, what is the assessment of the Penang State Government in terms of uh, I mean, how these projects are being received by the public? Sure. I mean, of course, obviously, first of all, there are some political elements involved in the voices that are opposed to us. That's fine. Uh, that's life in politics. But politics aside, uh, you also have to understand uh, Penang is rather unique. Uh, Penang has a great history of activism. Uh, we have many groups and NGOs that have been around for a long time uh, that have opposed and, in fact, continue to oppose all major projects. Uh, these same groups opposed the first Penang Bridge, they opposed the second Penang Bridge, 
the opposed the building of the Spice Convention Center, which is an iconic landmark here in Penang today. It's used for recreational purposes. It's used for conventions. Uh, and honestly, if if you know if we were to heed uh, the calls of all these groups, you know, if all the governments of the day had heeded their calls and stopped all the projects, we would not have any development in Penang. We wouldn't have what Penang is today, a thriving economy. That's the, that's the bottom line. So, so is it, um, are you in a position where the conversation has essentially stopped between the state government uh, activists? We often identify the Penang Forum as one of those collect, uh, collect platforms for those voices that you mentioned. Is there no way of winning your detractors over, of creating a, a statewide consensus on the kind of trade-offs that need to happen uh, to accommodate different aspirations, both the ones, or maybe a minority, but a, a, in some ways a very important minority who see things that maybe many of us don't see immediately, the long term, the long view of environmental sustainability. Is there any any possibility of a dialogue at this point in time? Well, Sharad, uh, we have never closed our doors. Uh, we have always listened to what they say, even, even if they think we don't. Uh, we do read what they write. Uh, we do listen to what they say. We have actually, uh, you know, organized uh, public forums, town halls. Uh, over the years, we've had, you know, public uh, dialogues, engagement sessions. In fact, part of the EIA requirement was to have a public display. Uh, you know, we had town halls. And, 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 you know, some of these discussions became heated. But that's, that's life. That's public life in Penang. That's fine. And we do continue to engage. We do uh, continue to have dialogue. Uh, they are free to, uh, you know, uh, uh, always engage us. Uh, they're, they're really, uh, we have no problem with that in Penang. And what about your um, your political allies? For instance, Nurul Isa, who recently came out to voice her objection publicly. Uh, politically, are you know, is the coalition kind of uh, is there consensus within uh, yourselves and your political allies about projects like the uh, tra transport master plan and the uh, South Reclamation project? There is definitely consensus. Uh, in fact, PKR sits in the state exco. The state cabinet has three uh, PKR representatives. They participate in every decision-making process. They have been uh, uh, in the decision-making process from day one. Uh, and every decision that has been made by the state has been unanimous. Uh, there has not been any objection. Uh, in fact, it is the PKR exco that chairs the uh, committee to oversee the fishing uh, uh, task force, for example, uh, and, and all the other PKR experts are also involved. Uh, Nurul Iza, I know, she uh, uh, made a statement the other day, but she is entitled to her point of view. You know, I, I think, you know, uh, we are mature enough uh, to, you know, uh, give and take in terms of uh, opinions. All right, uh, Zaria, thank you so much for joining us on the show. That was Penang Exco member in charge of infrastructure and transport. Zairel K. Johari. We're going to take a quick break, but more on Penang's South Reclamation project in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned to consider this.
Hi, you're watching Consider This. I'm Lisa Idris with me, Sharad Kutin. If you've just joined us on the show, we're discussing the trade-offs that are involved in Penang's transport master plan and its South Reclamation project, which involves the land reclamation of three islands. Let's speak now to Dr. Lim Mahui, economist and former Penang Island City Councillor. He's also with a uh, Penang Forum. Mahui, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Now, the uh, Penang State Government seems to have, um, they seem to have provided uh, a public answer for almost every concern that has been raised. Everything from financing to the environmental impact to the impact on, li on the livelihoods of uh, fisher folk. So, I'm just wondering, Mahui, have their answers been adequately addressed? Uh, have their answers adequately addressed the objections that you and others in civil society have raised about these projects? Um, they have answered some of the questions, but then answering a question doesn't mean answering them satisfactorily. So uh, I think, uh, you know, to our mind, uh, no, they are not properly answered. Let me, uh, I heard uh, some of the things that Zairo said. I just want to respond to two points. The first point, he said that, uh, you know, it's, it's just a small area and it really doesn't have very much environmental impact. I'm not sure if he read the uh, 1000 page uh, environmental impact assessment of the consultants of the SRS. Uh, some colleagues of mine and I have plowed through uh, substantial parts of this. And I want to quote, you know, chapter 7, uh, page 158, the words of the consultants of the uh, EI, uh, PSR EIA. I quote, the nature of reclamation is such that it is expected to lead to an irreversible change, underlined, in the area to be reclaimed. The original physical, biological resources and productivity of the reclamation footprint would be lost permanently particularly the coastal mud flats and its associated flora and fauna. Two pages later, it continues. The project area would largely be lost permanently, particularly uh, or losses of such magnitude are likely to be the key drivers of decline in biodiversity and ecosystem services in the intertidal zone of the region. So in short, uh, you know, I would uh, please uh, ask him to go and look through this chapter and see whether, you know, uh, he dives with what he says. The second part, he talks of creation. Sorry. The, the second no, no, point, he talks about job. Yes. Okay, job creation. I completely agree that we need to have jobs. Okay, but I don't think that jobs are created just simply by creating land. You can create a lot of land and if, uh, but that's not going to bring about jobs. I think there are better ways of creating jobs. For example, um, you know, we just saw uh, uh, there was an article on the age on June the 10th, just this month, that Austrian uh, company ATMS would invest 8.5 billion in the Kulim high tech park to produce high tech, uh, high end PCBs and integrated circuits and is expected to create 5,000 high-tech jobs. So, you know, and I cannot believe that, you know, mainland, which is double the size of Penang Island, all right, doesn't have enough uh, land. There must be a lot of brownfield land and uh, not paddy land, but uh, let's say plantations and all that, which uh, the state government should be able to, to, to try to uh, negotiate. I know they are running into trouble with uh, Sam Darby, okay? The other thing is, I want to question, just 10 years ago, when Pakatan Rakyat uh, took over, they had about 4,500 acres of land in Batu Kawan. That's the size of uh, the three islands that they're going to create. And this land were acquired actually by uh, Lim Chong Yu and Ko Su Kun, not the present government. And I want to ask, how come in 10 years, all that land is gone? What has the government got to show? Have they created 400,000 jobs out of the 4,500 acres of land that were all sold? What happened? 
Uh, very interesting questions, Maui. I do want to ask you, though, um, because Zyril does seem to acknowledge that there will be damage uh, to the area. The larger impact was he, he did not mention, uh, as you said, as to the, uh, the, the regional uh, eco uh, ecosystem. But I do want to ask you is, at the end of the day, do you think that there is going to be these kinds of trade-offs and it's the state government's uh, position now that this is a reasonable trade-off to make, uh, all things considered? First of all, I don't think the trade-off is necessary. I want to say uh, we, uh, in a civil society, don't object to the government's uh, aim to, for development and to create jobs. And as in the EIA, uh, they stated that the, the justification for the PSR uh, basically to create a smart city, to create jobs, uh, to, to relieve land pressure, and then to have a natural extension to the FTZ zone. All those we agree. But our point is that all those you know, lofty aims can be achieved by directing the development to the mainland, right? And without having to have trade-offs and sacrifice the environment, you know, uh, for growth. You know, the two can grow together, but they must be, you know, a balance uh, and, and not uh, unbalanced. And, and I want to say one thing, you know, now suddenly the first original uh, purpose or justification of the three islands is to finance the humongous 46 billion Penang Transport Master Plan. And suddenly, in the 1,000 pages of the EIA, not one word is mentioned about the PTMP. And neither did Zyril talk about the PTMP. It suddenly has vanished into thin, thin air. And that, you know, basically, our fears were confirmed that we, 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 we support the PTMP, but not in this humongous mega project form. And we suspected that this was basically a mega infrastructure and basically a property play. And I think our fears have now been confirmed by the fact that the two have been delinked. In one of my articles, I showed, and I would hear, like to hear them answer, and I've never heard an answer from them. They want to now reclaim Island A, which is the largest, as he said. Okay? And by reclaiming about the half of the Island A, uh, through this uh, joint venture with Gamuda, the state would end up with roughly about 600 million ringgit in 10 years' time. If you present value it, it's about 400 million ringgit. Now, that's patents. That's not enough to pay for one-tenth of the LRT that they talk about. So my question to them is, hey, you told us you want to develop this island to pay for the 4,600 billion. Now I've done some calculation and showed you after you reclaim the largest island, you only got 600 million. How are you going to finance the PDMP? They don't have an answer. Right, but Maui, can you ask you, in terms of the, the regulatory loops that, uh, or hoops rather, that the uh, state government has to jump through in order to get this uh, project approved, haven't they done so? I mean, did the EIA report suggest that this is not a project that should continue? Yes. Very unfortunately, you know, this EIA stuff, it's got a lot of uh, political uh, ramifications. You know, the EIA was rejected under um, the previous government, right? Uh, Junaidi was the environment minister and it was rejected. And then under the, you know, Pakatan Harapan, uh, under Yobin, it was approved by the, the Director General of the uh, of the Department of Environment on the last day when he uh, he basically uh, left the office. I mean, it leaves a lot of questions behind, and and we civil society is challenging the EIA, right? Uh, and uh, next month. There is an appeal. Uh, we are going to the appeal, uh, you know, on behalf of the fishermen, uh, the appeals board to challenge uh, the, the the approval of this uh, EIA. 
So the, the uh, least... Yeah. Right. Mahui, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think I just need to make something quite... Uh, to understand something um, better. You're, you're saying that you're not objecting to the transport master plan as a whole. You're yes. objecting to the reclamation of the islands, which is which will be used to finance the transport master plan. Is that is that accurate? Uh, not completely. We do not. We object to the master transport plan, as proposed by SRS, which is a 46 billion ringgit transport plan that you know has a lot of expensive toys. I say the LRT, the monorail the, uh, what do you call, uh, PIL one, all these, uh, you know, yesteryear's type of, 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 of uh, technology and stuff uh, that don't solve mobility problems. We, in fact, have come out, you know, they always say, oh, you object, object, but you don't have any alternatives and all this stuff. And Penang Forum, as early as, uh, you know, six years ago, came out with, you know, not a master plan, but certainly a roadmap, an alternative vision. We call it the better, cheaper, faster transport plan. And, you know, I've written a lot of articles which shows that, you know, it can be built for under 10 billion ringgit, okay? not 46 billion ringgit. We, civil society, were the ones who initiated the concept of the must, you know, transport master plan. But when it mutated, to become a mega infrastructure property play, we objected to it. For example, very quickly, I know I'm running out of time. They want to build this LRT, which is going to cost six to 10 billion. They started six billion, now it's about 10 billion. And it's going to take seven years, all right? And we said, hey, wait a minute. At that time, we said, you know, the, the health pro said, you should use trams, which are cheaper. And uh, they don't want, and then in 2018, there was a new technology called the ART, the trackless tram that came out. And again, Penang Forum suggested we should use that. You can build that uh, within less than a year and for right. under 1 billion, instead of seven years, 10 billion uh, for the LRT. They never wanted to do that. And in what, you know what? Sarawak and Johor have gone ahead and introduced the trackless tram. And we are left whistling behind, you know, whistling in the wind. And one, one Mahali, last thing about jobs. Mahali, very quickly, sorry, Mahali, very quickly, we're running out of time, as you, said, as you noted. Uh, do you think the state government of Penang is captured by particular interests, business interests, developers in particular, and who are actually in some ways shaping the agenda of the state? Uh, short answer is yes, very much so. And unfortunately, the government doesn't have the capacity evaluate and doesn't want to you know, get people to evaluate all these projects that have been put forward by the uh, what do you call uh, you know business interests you know and we have raised a lot of critical questions that they have not answered they really have not answered Okay, Mahu, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. That was former Penang Island City Councillor Lim Mahu. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutin signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching the show. Good night. Good night.